Welcome to part eight of the East Asian world. Let's take a look at the Qing government. The Qing emperors had to be many things to many people. I mean, first of all, you know, of course, they were Manchu, right? And they would use that to claim their Mongol ancestry, right? So that's where they were seen as the leader of the Manchu, but also a leader amongst the Mongols. They also shared a, uh, what was called a, Kak a Kakravatan ancestry, which gave them some lineage to the Tibetan Buddhists, right? But then they also held the mandate of heaven, right? The mandate of heaven, of course, then gave them that authority and power um, when you took a look at the, uh, the Chinese themselves. So you see there's many different hats. In the Western provinces like Xinjiang, they are going to set up local uh, governors uh, called Begs in order to control that region. In Tibet, they're going to have a garrison set up, placed under the command of what were called ambans, right, to keep the Tibetan Buddhists in line. Uh, as far as the central area itself, the mostly Chinese section, they uh, section of um, the Qing Dynasty, they use the typical Chinese system. Remember, I said they sinicized. You see the six ministries that had existed in previous dynasties set up, and the Manchu will govern under these six. Uh, ministries as well. Ministries of rights, of personnel, of revenue, of works, of punishment, and of war. And these ministries will govern the Manchu and the Qing uh, Empire. Now, like the previous dynasties, the Qing will also adopt the examination system in order to fill their bureaucratic ranks. Right, um, just like I had in the uh, in the, uh, for example, in the Ming Dynasty. Now, in order to uh, move up through the ranks, you had to pass a series of different tests. First, you'd have a qualifier test. If you pass the qualifying test, you were allowed to take the county-based test. The county-based test, if you passed it, you would get bestowed the rank of Xing Yuan. If you're a Xing Yuan, you're a level one bureaucrat. That means that you can have any kind of bureaucratic post. It also makes you exempt from corporal punishment as well, if you're even this low-level uh, scholar. Now, from there, you could take the provincial exam. The provincial exam, if passed, would bestow upon you the rank of German. Germans then would be allowed to take the metropolitan examination in Beijing, right, that if you passed would give you the uh, title of Gongxi, and if you were among a uh, Gongxi, quite literally means tribute literatus, right? And if you passed, if you were one of the highest qualifiers, you would actually get the uh, title of Jinshi, which means presented literatus, right? Jinshi was the highest rank. So you got four ranks that are developed out of this, right? Um, now, these are very competitive exams. People will start studying them for these things at a very young age, and you have to do things like memorize the four books and the five classics. I mean, a lot of the classic works of the previous dynasties, poetry, uh, dynastic histories, you name it, right? In a typical year, you would have two million people that would uh, apply to uh, try and become uh, Xing Yuan, right? Two million people. Now, only about uh, 30,000 would succeed in uh, obtaining that rank, and only about 1,500 would make it to Jurin, and uh, Jinshi would only make, only about 300 would make that highest rank. Now, here's the thing, though. Even though you pass the exam and you've got these, you know, this, uh, um, this status, it didn't necessarily give you a job. I mean, across China, you had maybe 20,000 bureaucratic jobs available, right, across the Qing dynasty. You've got 300 Jinshi per year. You've got 1,500 Jurin. Uh, typically, you had to be Jinshi in order to get a job anywhere in the Qing uh, bureaucracy. And you could be Jinshi and spend your entire career in some real low-level position. Now, the county was the basic building block of this bureaucracy, right? This was the smallest uh, uh, geographical region that would have some kind of bureaucratic control, right? Uh, there was 1,528 of them in the Qing uh, Empire. 
uh, the uh, each county would have a magistrate assigned to it who was called the father mother official and he had a multitude of jobs he had to get done he was responsible for collecting taxes uh, investigating and trying criminal cases uh, for adjudicating civil cases managing the public works uh, dealing with natural disasters uh, administra uh, administering the county level examination remember we still got to do that and setting the proper moral example for the population now each one of these magistrates were uh, given a four-year term in the county in which they were uh, uh, um, had authority over after four years they would be cycled over into a different county you were never allowed to be a magistrate in the county from which you came that was uh, keep you know, the moving you around and keeping you from your home county prevented the formation of cabals that might pose an eventual threat to the Qing dynasty. Law and order in the Qing dynasty was administered through what was called the Great Qing Code, a very detailed code of laws. In the Great Qing Code, there were five acceptable forms of punishment each one with increasing uh, severity. The lowest one was a beating with a light bamboo, right? Next was a beating with a heavy bamboo. That's what you're seeing in the picture right here. Next was penal servitude, right? Basically enslavement, then exile, and then finally execution, okay? And the laws themselves are outlined in great detail, right? For example, here's one. Uh, whenever a horse, bovine animal, or dog rams, butts, kicks, or bites people, and the owner has not marked or tied it in the right way, or if, uh, or if there is a mad dog and he does not kill it, he will receive 40 strokes of the light bamboo. See, very detailed. And let's say, even though these laws are that detailed, let's say if some law or some offense happens that is just not covered by this code, well, they got a stopgap for that, too. Everyone who does that which ought not be done will receive 40 strokes of the light bamboo. If the matter is adjudged to be more serious, he will be punished by 80 strokes of the heavy bamboo. See, you're covered. Crimes of young men against older men were always seen as more severe. That's fallen back to that filial piety that uh, we've talked about before, right? Um, if the crime was seen as too uh, serious for the county magistrate to uh, deal with, he could actually uh, kick it up the chain of the command, if you will, to the provincial magistrate and then on from there, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff for these county magistrates to administer. And so they would uh, bring in yeoman clerks. They would be commissioned to collect taxes and do all this day-to-day -day business in these counties. I and mean, these counties, the population, you got one guy, right? These populations could be 10,000, it could be 100,000, right? Now, these clerks would go about and do this. Now, there's no budget for these clerks. So they go around, they collect taxes. They're allowed to collect a fee for that. So needless to say, this creates a great avenue for corruption, right? And so you see these yeoman clerks, some of them become quite powerful, even exerting influence over the magistrates themselves. Now, one thing you can say for certain about this system set up by the chain right in every quarter the emperors and high-ranking officials could be brutal and corrupt that the locals had a tendency to take advantage of the uh the loopholes in the system the tax exploits and of course the people themselves and thirdly in general the people still followed this there was still just that general belief that they were being led by superior men and that they should listen and obey that filial piety again uh, kicking in. 